Maximize Business Value Podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Mastery Partners, where our mission is to equip business owners to maximize business value so they can transition their business on their terms. Our mission was born from the lessons we've learned from over 100 business transactions, which fuels our desire to share our experiences and wisdom so you can succeed. Now, here's your host, CEO of Mastery Partners, Tom Bronson. Hi, this is Tom Bronson, and welcome to Maximize Business Value, a podcast for business owners who are passionate about building long-term sustainable value in their businesses. In this episode, I am so excited to welcome our guests, Cleve Clinton, a partner at Gray Reed Law Firm, and Susan Bryant, principal at the MB Group, a certified public accounting firm. Although they both have recently appeared on this podcast separately, I asked them to come back today because we're going to talk about year-end business and tax planning. So I met Cleve through a mutual friend several years ago, and we've become great friends. He is a master storyteller who, as a corporate attorney with broad spectrum of clients, has been there and done that in almost every legal situation you can imagine. He represents Mavericks. Uh, in business who dream big, dare big, and get into big trouble. Uh, Susan and I met earlier this year, and and I've really become impressed about how she thinks and works with her clients as their CPA. Accounting is so much more than just reporting the numbers. She really views accounting as a calling to help her clients get better, both professionally and personally. She makes uh, a, she becomes sort of a pseudo CFO role in the businesses that she works with, and I can tell you that they count on her as a trusted as advisor. So, as I mentioned earlier, uh, today we're going to talk about year end tax and business planning as it relates to building long term sustainable value in your business. So, welcome to Maximize Business Value, Cleve and Susan. Good to have you with us today. Good to be here. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, same here, Tom. Thanks. Awesome. So starting with Cleve, give us a quick snapshot about yourself. If you want to hear more about Cleve, you can go back to the prior podcast, but a quick snapshot about yourself and about Gray Reed. Thanks, Tom. Well, over the last 40 years, I've represented a number of Fortune 500 clients. Those clients who stretch my problem-solving creativity, those are my bread and butter clients, are those business owners who wake up every morning, pull themselves up by their bootstraps, and often put the success of their business on the line every day. As a board-certified civil trial lawyer, that expertise served me well for decades. Now, those business owners are maturing, and they're less inclined to pick a courthouse fight. They're more preferring non-litigation solutions and protecting, often even transitioning their ownership to other family members. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that stretches your uh, ability to find solutions. I like that. (laughs) Susan, tell us about yourself and about the MB Group. Awesome. Well, thanks again for having me, Tom. My name is Susan Bryant. I'm a CPA with the MB Group. The MB Group is a CPA firm, and we specialize in providing business owners with outsourced accounting services so anything from, you know, AP, AR, bank updates, bank reconciliations, kind of the whole, the whole soup to nuts on accounting side. And then we take that information and we help them to strategize on the tax side um, to ensure that they are um, making the best decisions with their money and paying the least amount of tax. Awesome. Awesome. I know you do a great job uh, with your clients as well. I know many of them and, and uh, very thrilled with the work that they do at the MB Group. So in, uh, in the first half of our podcast today, we're going to talk about business planning. After the break, we'll focus on tax planning. So let's dive right in. Uh, many business owners don't really take the time to think strategically and plan for their upcoming year before it actually starts. As we wind down 2020 and hopefully put this one in the rear view as quickly as possible, uh, what are some of the things a business owner should really take the time to think about before the end of the year? Let's start with Cleve and then Susan. Well, Tom, my tax partners in my office, my financial planner friends, 
And my CPA friends like Susan are a Twitter with the prospects of what this election might be doing to their businesses. One way spells business as usual. How can I ramp up with more with what I'm doing? The other presents an incredibly icy road coming down a steep Colorado mountain laced with danger, curves ahead signs, especially for those who have adjusted their business to life under the 2018 Tax Act. Once the election dust settles, perhaps very timely and significant business tax decisions are going to need to be made. Susan and I talked about some of those yesterday, potentially very serious tax implications of managing a family's estate tax exemption among them. She also mentioned the possibility of an impact to small business owners who have relied upon the Trump tax cut and a rollback of that tax cut. Susan, what's going on? Yeah, I think uh, this is definitely the time to be um, every year before the end of the year. I think the first thing you have to ask yourself is, <clears throat> what did I do this year? What did I do last year? How am I organized? What type of entity do I have? Is that the best thing for me to continue? And working with someone like Cleve is to really ask yourself, am I being the most efficient by way of tax, but also am I managing my liability in the right way? And just going through that discussion. So, so many times people get into this kind of rut of, well, that's just how it's set up. So that's just how it has to be. And that's not the case. That's the way it is right now, but how do you want it to be? And so we really got to force that, um, that discussion and say, okay, just because this is the way it is right now and that's how it was last year, how, if we could do something different, what would we do different and should we implement those changes now? So starting 1-1, one, one, we start off on a different foot. Maybe, you know, a, a C corporation is not the best route for you to go. Maybe you need to be thinking about uh, organizing a different way, making an election to, to be, you know, switching to an S corporation. So many different things to think about, but now is the time to be contemplating what changes you might be wanting to make. Yeah, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of, of saying that uh, if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there, right? Yeah. Like Cheshire Cat True. Says. And so, so to me, this time of year is all about planning and thinking about. I love the, the uh, thought there of look back, not just at what we did this year, but the prior year and what are our hopes and dreams and how do we accomplish those goals uh, in the coming year. Susan, you mentioned something important, but uh, Cleve, let's go to you first on this. Uh, is now a good time to think about your corporate structure, like C Corp, S Corp, LLC, partnership, that kind of thing? Well, Tom, I have a couple of thoughts on that. First, yes, 2021 would be a very timely time to start a, and form a new separate entity, especially if you're already effectively operating as partners or if you're planning to transition your business either to a third party or within your own family. Given the possible government roller coaster that the election is going to present from a arguably business friendly Congress to a possibly new Congress that might change all the taxes and upset the apple cart, maybe it's time to return to the bread and butter of why do you form a separate entity in the first place? Uh, litigation risk management and providing a map to your partners, your family, to agreeably how you would navigate changes in the business and its owners down the road are really the primary reasons why you want to form a separate entity. And they probably should be your driving factor as we enter uh, the end of 2021. Taxes could, can and should be an issue. And that's when you call Susan in order to make sure that you got the right planning for the year in with the structure you've got. And yet, don't let the tax dog wag the business dog. The tax tail, I should say, wag the business dog. The taxes are a nice benefit, but really litigation risk management and transitioning and problem solving built into what amounts to a, a contract with your partners is the preferable solution from my viewpoint in, in dealing with the, the right entity to have. Number two, tend to your knitting. It's time to observe your corporate formalities. It, yes, it is end of year, whether it's gonna be for a later sale or an IRS look-see down the road, or better yet, just memorializing those important touchstones that you have covered over this last year. I cannot imagine that you've not had some big touchstones in this last year. Pick one of the adverbs or adjectives that it's been called by everybody. Now, because of all that, you've got some things that probably should be memorialized plus which, and I've, I've dealt with this more times than I can count, over the years, there are small bits of friction that start occurring between partners and family members and whoever, whoever. 
they kind of build up over time. And the risk that you run is that they, when they finally boil over years later, they're a, a, an amalgamation of all sorts of things that have happened perhaps over a decade for which you now have either faint memories and no paper or worse yet, you, you forgot them entirely. Whereas your corporate records should reflect those changes year in and year out. Put your resolutions in writing, review and comply with your company documents. What do you think, Susan? Oh, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I think that um, the governing documents, I mean, there's, there's so many um, clients who come to us and they don't even have an operating agreement um, and they've got multiple owners. I mean, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's distressing because in a lot of cases, they just either didn't know what to do or didn't know where to get advice. So they were just poorly advised. And I mean, the entity is so important to respect because you're right. It doesn't matter till it matters. And then all of a sudden, you got a really big problem because you have not taken care of this entity and you, you have not memorialized things. You haven't complied with the governing documents or the law. And so, boom, you've got a really big problem. So I could not agree more with that. Um, I, I think on the eve of this election, as, as, we, as we sit here and we talk about this, I think there are definitely some things that people are probably going to be wanting to do in terms of forming entities with, a, with some type of contingent plan as to what might happen. So um, I think it's going to be wise for people to, um, to get creative and be really thinking about what might be down the road um, and make sure that we're setting up entities and configuring in the right, right way so that if there is an opportunity to reduce taxes under some type of new tax regime that we're able to do it and where we have not um, been uh, sort of remiss in seizing those opportunities before, um, beforehand. So... I've got a, definitely a year to plan ahead, Tom. Definitely a year to plan ahead. Boy, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of keeping your corporate records in order. And that's one of the things that just slips by so many people. You know, I, I, many of our clients, one of the first things we ask when we do an assessment is, are your corporate records in order? Uh, and I'm really surprised at the number of companies that are, that are 10, 20, 30, even 40 years old that don't have their corporate records in order. They haven't memorialized any resolutions. They don't have a proper uh, organizational docs. They don't have uh, an operating agreement when they have multiple partners. You know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of, of when, you, when you start a business to get all of those things in order right. Imagine, if you will, the worst possible outcome and, and figure out how to deal with it on the front end as opposed to having to deal with it on the back end when it gets very costly and, and uh, probably you're going to have to find a, a legal solution. So, so uh, now is a great time of year to, uh, to be thinking about updating your corporate records uh, and doing that thing. So are there, are there reasons, uh, perhaps, Susan, that you might want to move from one structure, say a C-Corp to an S-Corp or an LLC or a partnership or from a partnership to one of those others? Are there reasons that you might want to do that? And if so, are there timing considerations for that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, there are definitely reasons. I mean, and there's essentially four different ways and you know, entities can be taxed. So, uh, a disregarded entity, so usually that means it's reported on a Schedule C. Um, the S-Corp, which has its own set of rules, so it has to be um, actual individuals, only one class of stock, less than 100 shareholders, can't be owned by any trust. Um, lots of things that are proportionate to ownership happen there, including the income and expense allocations, distribution allocations. Partnerships become a lot more flexibility, the introduction of who, who owns it, other entities, foreign partners. And then, of course, the C corporations, which um, are sort of more traditional and in the way that most people view companies being operated so that um, you know, there's uh, dividends that are issued, introduces the concept of uh, double taxation. Are there things that people should be thinking about? Absolutely. Do people know why they're in a certain type of entity? Generally, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I think the, the question really becomes is for my business and what I want to accomplish and who owns this company, am I in the right structure? So um, there's multiple reasons why some of them are favorable or unfavorable based upon who the owners are and what their ultimate goal is. So um, yeah, there's definitely some things we would want to be planning for leading up to the beginning of a new year um, because we know there's elections that would have to transpire um, on March 15th in order to be treated a certain way or forming a new entity and migrating our operations into those entities at the beginning of the year. So um, yeah, 
So I think that the, there's a, this is probably the area that I struggle with the most with new clients when they come in and they have no idea why they're taxed the way that they're taxed um, because no one's ever taken the time to really educate them on what the differences are between those entities. And this, it, it is such a critical thing in understanding why they operate the way they, the way they operate. I've got a, a small client, very small business um, that is a C-Corp and has been for many, many years. And I've recommended that they think about uh, considering uh, moving to an S-Corp, um, especially years before a transition. Um, there's something called a look back. Um, uh, mm-hmm. if, you, if you change that, uh, if you change uh, your corporation type, Susan, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are a lot of tax rules that are related to um, when you are moving from one entity type to another entity type, it can create and trigger additional taxes to be owed. And that's certainly just something that you're trying to avoid as much as possible. And so when you're moving from a C corp to an S corp and you're having a transaction that's, that's transpiring in within that look back period, you're going to end up with a big tax surprise and it's not, you're not going to be pleasantly surprised by it. So, um, so there, there has to be, there has to be some planning ahead again with any type of exit or any type of change in any type of entity formation structure, you know, there's entity planning in general, always need to have multiple partners, like making sure your attorney, someone like Tom, you, Tom, from an exit strategy, everyone's working together to understand what the game plan is. We cannot make these decisions in a vacuum. We've got to involve the entire team of advisors so we're making decisions that are right, not only for the business, but also for the individual later. Yeah, that's, that's one of the strongest arguments when people ask me, well, gosh, I'm not going to sell my business for three to five years. So I really don't want to think about that until now. That to me is one of the strongest arguments why you should think of these things three to five years in advance, because you want, if you're going to make a change, and it's recommended that you make a change in your in the type of corporation that you are. Uh, then, then you want to have that done and, and over with and in the rear view long before any lookout or, or uh, long before uh, any time that you might have that look back as a consequence and and get that nice little surprise, uh, if you will. So, uh, Cleve, what about you? Are there reasons that you should would think about moving from one structure to another and and for in in your case, from a legal standpoint, are there any kind of timing considerations as well? Well, I've got a client who wondered how they ended up where they did. The, the dad started the company. He started it off as a sole proprietorship. His lawyers talked him into forming an, uh, a, limit, a corp. He said it was a C corp. Then they said, for tax purposes, you need to make it an S corp. This was back in the 90s, which he did. And then... Uh, the Texas imposed a franchise tax. And so the darling of the, about the turn of the 2000 century was uh, you need to form an LLC, a bigger part in a limited partnership. So they formed a limited partnership. And then you can imagine all the, the trailing of documents, pieces of corporate formalities, lack thereof that trailed all that. So then dad dies, mom dies, and now you've got all the kids are now inheriting it. And the structure just does not work the formalities didn't work. The underlying agreements didn't work. The bylaws, you name it, it didn't work. So in that situation, the, the idea was you'd form an LLC. We formed a structured L- a series of LLCs that have worked out really well. Uh, what I like about the LLC in this circumstance is that it provides what amounts to, for all practical purposes, a contract. Anybody can basically sit down and read it. It's not nearly as complicated appearing anyway as a lot of other documents do. And so it's worked out really well for this family. We've talked about going from the corporate, it's still taxed as a, as a C-Corp. We've talked about taking it from a C-Corp, even though an LLC, it's taxed for, tax for IRS purposes as a C-Corp. We've talked about it going to a sub-S, but with a 2018 Tax Reform Act, uh, it was so close between the tax under the S-Corp and under this, uh, the C-Corp we just left it where it is, that may change. Yeah. <laughs> well, and some people, you know, it, it, when they think about the, the C-Corp, I mean, it used to be like nobody wanted a C-Corp because especially a small business or double taxation. Um, but yeah, with the advent of the 21% flat tax rate, which is, you know, a little bit on the docket here in terms of what's ahead, 
But right now, yeah, I mean, it turned out to be a little bit of a wash. And then you maybe have to take advantage of a few other things that are available in C-Corps that weren't available in an S-Corp. So, you know, employee reimbursement program for medical expenses, long-term care insurance being deductible, deferred comp plans, you know, some other things like that, that all of a sudden, you know, okay, the C-Corp's looking pretty good. You know, this is not a bad structure to have. So... So, so what you're telling me is that uh, there's no just cut and dried answer. You should do this or you should do that. You should oh. really get your team of advisors. And that should always include uh, a, a uh, CPA and an attorney uh, to have those conversations. We want to be involved in that conversation as well. But uh, uh, you should get those folks uh, involved so that you can determine what is the right uh, structure. So one last question before we take a break. In addition to corporate structure, are there other things a business owner should consider adding to their strategic to-do list uh, before year end? Uh, I believe you want to start with that and then to Susan. In addition to a corporate structure, what should they be doing by year? I, 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 I really believe that the biggest thing they can do is hold a company meeting and plan on what, look at what happened in 2020 and plan for 2021, looking in the rearview mirror at 2020. I think that most companies, many companies, have been the deer caught in the headlights for the last eight or 10 months. They've been paralyzed with pick one of any number of possible emotions. And really, if they would just kind of pick their heads up and look around, there are some real opportunities out there, both in the near term and in the long term for their businesses. The trick is trying to figure out where do they need to pivot and turn into the new opportunities that have been presented? A, a basic classic SWOT analysis. What are the company's strengths, weaknesses, uh, fears, and threats, and opportunities? And uh, I would focus on the opportunities. The opportunities, I think, are, are really, uh, they're strong and they're vibrant. And there's going to be a big 2021, I think, for many, many businesses. It's just those who are prepared for it will do the best. I, I couldn't agree more completely with you. Even companies that have been dramatically impacted by COVID, uh, if they really sat down and explored the opportunities and, and seized on those opportunities, many of them have come out sort of on the, well, we hope on the backside of this, uh, it, much stronger than they were even beforehand. There is always opportunity when, when, uh, when adversity happens. Susan, same question to you. Anything that we need to add to the strategic to-do list? Um, yeah, so I think compliance is going to be a really big thing going into 2021. So um, if, you, um, if you charge sales tax, if you have sales tax nexus in other states, um, you, or you potentially have that, I think you need to check it out. Um, the states are going to be really desperate for money. Sales tax audits are going to go up. Get ready. So get your compliance in order. Um, I definitely, I think also the IRS is going to start getting really um, uh, rigid about things when, because when an audit does happen, when you do get selected, even though we know the rate of audits are going down, when you do get selected, I think they're going to start hammering. So we've got to make sure we've got substantiation. We've got um, records. So I mean, when, when your CPA starts asking you, I need the whole detailed general ledger. I need everything to support this. The W-2s, I need to see the 1099s. They need it. And you want them to have it because they're going to keep it in their records to help you if you get audited. Um, and then I think this is some ancillary things. Like, I really think this is a good time of year to talk about, like, HR compliance. Like, go through and look at your files. I mean, I'm not an HR person, but I know that that's a really big deal. Make sure you've got all the right training, you know, things in place for people. You've got budget set for people and um, for your company, you're really going through and taking a holistic look. At what are you trying to accomplish next year and getting those initiatives laid out in the company? Awesome. All, all great things. So we're talking with Cleve Clinton, an attorney with Gray Reed and Susan Bryant, a principal with the accounting firm MB Group. Let's take a quick break. Back in 30 seconds. Every business will eventually transition some internally to employees and managers, and some externally to third-party buyers. Mastery Partners equips business owners to maximize business value so they can transition their businesses on their terms using our four-step process. We start with a snapshot of where your business is today. Then we help you understand where you want to be and design a custom strategy to get you there. Next, we help you execute that strategy with the assistance of our amazing resource network. And ultimately, you'll be able to transition your business on your terms. 
What are you waiting for? More time? More revenue? If you want to maximize your business value, it takes time. Now is that time. Get started today by checking us out at www.masterypartners.com or email us at info at masterypartners.com to learn more. We're back with CPA Susan Bryant and attorney Eve Clinton, and we're talking about year-end planning. So let's switch over to business tax planning. We talked a little bit about that in the first half. Uh, Susan, what advice would you give your clients as we move toward year end? Um, Make sure your accounting records are updated so that you can give them to your CPA so they can actually help you to develop a strategy to reduce your taxes. So, I mean, everything begins with accounting records. If you don't have good accounting records, there's no way that we can do tax projections. So, and it really becomes meaningless any strategy that you have. So that's the beginning point. From there, I really think business owners have to really have discussions about using money in the right way. So I'm not a fan of spending money just to get a tax deduction. It's spending money, get the tax deduction, and it's an ROI in my business somehow. So if I buy a piece of equipment, I get the tax right off, but then there's also some reason in the business where I get a return on having spent that money. So um, I know a lot of people are like, oh, we're just going to spend some money and you know that's going to reduce our taxes. But that, I mean, your cash is way more valuable than a, a deduction. So you really have to go in with that mindset. It is time to um, let's leverage and use that QBI deduction as long as we have it this year, maximize it. So many business owners have no idea what that is and they miss it. And the CPAs, um, there's a lot of CPAs who haven't quite figured it out just yet. So we're not running enough payroll before he ends, year end. So we, there's a lot of them that are leaving deduction on the table. So um, that's where I would start with year end tax planning. So uh, cash is king. I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. And if, if we didn't learn anything else out of 2020, uh, we should learn that it's very important to have a healthy um, uh, liquid asset on your balance sheet. Uh, and so, yeah, don't, don't go spending just to, to spend. Make sure that that's a great advice to make sure that you're going to get a great return on your investment when you do invest. Susan, do you have a, a, like a laundry list of action items that, uh, that business owners should take you know, before you end, year end, just kind of tick those things down? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, it's anything from really look at how you file taxes on what basis. So accrual versus cash. Sometimes it makes sense to be one or the other. A lot of, again, people do not receive the proper advice on how to choose that. They just, it's just a default. It can be changed with the proper uh, application to the IRS. Um, Definitely uh, the QBI deduction prepay of your cash basis tax filer, prepaying certain expenses um, that you know you're already going to have repay them and get the tax right off now. Although I would maybe, I don't know, this year, I might also be making some recommendation to say, well, depending on what happens with the election, that deduction might be more valuable to me next year because we can, if we have a change in power, then tax rates are likely to go up and that deduction might be worth more to me next year. So there's a lot of thinking that has to happen that goes into that. And there are opportunities to write off inventory and take write-offs for that. I had one client where we wrote off their inventory under the TCJA. Um, It was about $5 million of write-off. It uh, resulted in a net operating loss on their personal return. We cured it back and we got them $500,000 back of taxes that they had paid in at a 39.6% tax rate. So it's just found money. So um, with the with the CARES Act this year, uh, the fact that we have the ability to carry losses back, I mean, it's definitely something worth investigating for sure. So um, always working with your CPA, talking about charitable deductions on the personal side. Should you, if you are philanthropic, use of a donor advised fund, sort of lumping in a series of years of donations into one year, especially if you've got a high income um, projection for one year, it'd be be really awesome. Um, and maybe that'd be something you would save for 2021 as well. Um, making sure you are connecting your financial advisor with your CPA. So if there are capital gains, capital losses, any other activities that are happening with your, your investments that they know, and they're planning for the tax ramifications of what those might be. So, um, but I literally could spend an hour talking about those. So, 
Well, I think the good news is, is we agreed before we recorded this, that you're going to give us kind of the top 15 tax planning tips. And we're going we're gonna to have you guest blog that this week uh, uh, on our uh, website. So be on the lookout uh, for that as well. So we've alluded several times to, uh, to the election, the upcoming election, but it is upon us. This podcast is actually being recorded on election day. Uh, and so we don't yet know the outcome. And, and frankly, when this is released next week, uh, of course, it'll be today when you hear it. But when it's released, we may still not know the outcome. So regardless of the outcome, should business owners be thinking about ma- minimizing taxes this year? Uh, and what should they do uh, next year to do the same thing? Yeah, that's a um, yes. So, I mean, every, every tax dollar, Sayer, Susan, bring it, bring your crystal ball. <laughs> so every tax dollar we can keep in our business and we don't remit to the government is a dollar is working for us. If we give it to the IRS, you know, then it's working. Or is the government going to put it to work the same way you would? No, absolutely not. We already know that. So our number one goal is obviously we're operating within the code where every regulation, we're doing everything we can legally to minimize the amount of taxes we pay in so we can keep that money in our business so we can create more jobs and opportunity for for our company. So, I mean, any any year we can save taxes is a year we've been successful in in our jobs, but in successful in building those businesses and keeping them strong. So going into next year, I think we're going to have same philosophy, but I think the way that we potentially execute those things is going to be far different. So um, with the the tax changes that uh, I think it was December 17, right? The last sort of sweeping uh, tax changes uh, that that were announced, we could have the same thing uh, next year, especially if the administration uh, changes. And so, you know, at that point, I would, I would recommend that you get with your uh, tax professional uh, to think about what those changes are and what the impacts might be and some things that you might do. So right now, everything that we talk about for sort of for 2020 is a little bit conjecture, but same question to you. Um, you know, what should business owners be thinking about, you know, now that this election uh, is, uh, is upon us, Cleve? Well, at first, I was imagining I was going to be sounding contrary to to Susan on what she said initially. And then she circled back around and said, if you can get the tax money in your pocket this year, take it. And that was my advice. That was going to be my advice as well. If you can minimize taxes, do so. The other thing that struck me is that what happens, it would be interesting, we're talking as if a lot of things must be done if the current administration stays into next year, all the more reason to take advantage of whatever the tax benefits are this year and begin your planning for for taxes next year as well. So uh, you never know whether you'll have the option next year, even if the the same administration stays in place, take the money while, while if it's on the table, take it off the table this year. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, go ahead and minimize your taxes now and think of a way next year to be able to minimize and do the same thing, if at all possible. So uh, so it really depends on uh, what happens in the next few weeks. So, so one last question. This podcast is all about maximizing business value. Uh, we'll start with you, Cleve. What's the one most important thing you recommend business owners do before year end to build long-term sustainable value in their business? I've already alluded to it. Have your annual meeting, report on what the company's done this last year in ways that will be useful to you down the road, whether you're selling your business or dealing with what later becomes irate owners and evaluate what your opportunities are. I, there's a lot of opportunities out there. And anytime there's that this kind of chaos intersecting with stability in the middle of all that is a lot of opportunity for creativity and a lot of opportunities for growth and redirected uh, business profits. So good luck and seize the opportunity while it's there. Awesome. Same question to you. What is the one most important thing you recommend business owners do to build long-term sustainable value in their business, Susan? Uh, I think this year, more than any other year, it is important to make sure you have chosen the right advisors to surround yourself with 
This is really important, whether it's a financial advisor who can help guide you and direct you, you know, on your investments, uh, personal or in the business, to make sure you're, you're only taking the amount of risk that you're willing to take. On the accounting side, that you are working with um, a tax advisor who is up to date with their knowledge of the law, that they spend time being educated and learning and working with the same type of clients that you are. Um, and then on the legal side, making sure that you have someone who is in your corner really advocating for your business in terms of how it's structured and making sure that all of these elements. And then, of course, Tom, other business professionals like yourself, making sure that you're thinking about long term planning. You know, have you have a sales and marketing strategy? Um, do you have HR resources? I mean, so many advisors that you need to be surrounding yourself with. Make sure you got the right team. Yeah, I wow, I couldn't I couldn't have said that better myself. As as you both know, uh, it's and my clients know that I have a firm belief that not all CPAs are cut from the same cloth, and not all attorneys are cut from the same cloth. If your interaction with your CPA is once a year at tax time then you probably might consider um, talking uh, with uh, or updating that relationship or getting a new CPA. Same thing, if the only time you ever talk to your uh, corporate attorney uh, is when you're in trouble, uh, then you probably ought to think about uh, finding a better attorney. And we've got great choices sitting right in front of you, uh, folks that you can see today, both Cleve uh, and Susan would be great choices to fill either of those roles. Of course, you, you both have been on the podcast before. Uh, and I always ask the same question at the end of the podcast, but since I've already asked that question of you, which is the personality trait that's gotten you into most trouble through the years, uh, we already know the answer to that. So in light of this being November uh, and with Thanksgiving right around the corner, the burning question of the day is turkey or ham and what's your favorite Thanksgiving dessert? So Cleve, we'll start with you. <laughs> Well, of course, Tom, it would have to include my favorite business maximizer, Tom Bronson, and, and my soon-to-be favorite CPA, Susan Bryant. But with those, uh, I, I'm a ham kind of guy. I'd go with ham, and I would also go with pecan pie a la mode. Ooh, wow. Great choices. Susan, what about you? Okay, so I'm picky about my turkey. I like ham, but for Thanksgiving, turkey, but I really like smoked turkey. So uh, that's, that's where I would go. And then for dessert, I'm going to stick with good old pumpkin pie. Awesome. Boy, I, I'm going with you on both counts there, Susan. I, I uh, typically get a heritage uh, turkey. Uh, they're very expensive, but uh, organic, grass-fed, you know, and, and, uh, but very delicious. I have a big smoker out back. Smoke that baby for a few hours oh. before Thanksgiving dinner, and it is Awesome. Be sure you cut your turkey correctly so that it retains the juices. If you want to know more about that, I can recommend a website to go to. But pumpkin pie, my grandmother um, used to make pumpkin pies from pumpkins. You know, what a novel concept. You know, pumpkin doesn't grow in a can. It grows, <laughs> it's a big orange thing at Thanksgiving. And, uh, and I will tell you that I have never in my life eaten a pumpkin pie that was made from pumpkin out of a can. Uh, and my wife, uh, God love her for, for the, one of the many thousands of reasons that I love her each year at this time of year, she goes through the process of taking pumpkins, you know, uh, cooking them down, scraping it out and making me a real pumpkin pie. And, and I love her for that and many other reasons. So smoked turkey and, uh, and pumpkin pie. But uh, Cleve, I'll stop over and have some ham and, uh, and uh, pecan pie at your place, uh, <laughs> perhaps the day after Thanksgiving. So, so how can our uh, viewers and listeners get in touch with you? First Cleve, then Susan. Well, again, I'm Cleve Clinton. I'm a... Uh, advisor and counselor, also a board certified civil trial lawyer at Gray Reed and McGraw. You can find us at grayreed.com. I also do a monthly uh, blog called Tilting the Scales that you're welcome to check out sometime and see if it answers any of your, uh, your legal questions. Awesome. Susan, how about you? Awesome. Yes. Again, my name is Susan Bryant. I'm a principal with the MB group. You can reach us at mbgcpa.com or you can email me at sbryant at mbgcpa.com. And um, yeah, I would love to have people visit our website too. We've got lots of resources out there and um, always love sharing uh, things like this uh, with, uh, with our, uh, our clients as well. 
Awesome. If you are looking for an attorney, I highly recommend you talk to Cleve. If you're looking for a new CPA, uh, then I would highly recommend, of course, that you talk to Susan. You can find uh, both of them at their respective websites or on LinkedIn. And of course, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to make a warm introduction. Cleve and Susan, what a fun conversation. Thank you for being on today. Thank you, Tom, for including us. Awesome. Uh, This is the Maximize Business Value Podcast, where we give practical advice to business owners on how to build long-term sustainable value in your business. Be sure to tune in each week and follow us wherever you found this podcast. Be sure to comment. We love comments and we respond to all of them. So until next time, I'm Tom Bronson reminding you to plan for year end while you still have the time as you maximize your business value. Thank you for tuning into the Maximize Business Value podcast with Tom Bronson. This podcast is brought to you by Mastery Partners, where our mission is to equip business owners to maximize business value so they can transition on their terms. Learn more on how to build long-term sustainable business value and get free value building tools by visiting our website, www.masterypartners.com. That's master with a Y, masterypartners.com. Check it out. That was perfect. I wouldn't make any changes on that.